It's a hot topic at the forefront today, recreational marijuana. Supporters of the smokable plant are pushing for the legalization, while the country's attorney general is warning of an America with the drug sold at every corner grocery store. I'm Rana Kamal. This is Our Issues, Twin Cities. For Lee, walking through these doors changed his life. When I went in for my first appointment and got home, took my first dose of the medicine, within 45 minutes, my muscle spasm stopped, my pain was gone. Lee, a father of two, was diagnosed with fibromyalgia in 2016. You know, you're a father of two little girls, you're a husband, you work over 15 hours a day. How did it affect your life? I got to the point where I basically was depressed sitting in a room, just messed up on pain pills because that was the only thing that was helping me. Um, I got to the point where I couldn't pick up my own kids. After intractable pain was added to the short list of qualifying conditions for medical cannabis, Lee decided to join the program in hopes of finally treating his chronic pain. There are approximately 100 million Americans who suffer from chronic pain. We are now blessed in Minnesota to have truly medicinal medical cannabis and care as an option. In 2014, Minnesota became the 22nd state to legalize medical marijuana. Leafline Labs is one of two dispensaries in the state. Andrew is the founder. A lot of the education that we have done throughout this process since our registration on December 1st, 2014 is taking hold. It's because truly education is the key. Education, education, education. When people know uh, this is not scary. This is, in fact, necessary. Today, Leafline Labs has four operating dispensaries across the state, functioning much like care centers. The first year of the medical cannabis program was a struggle with low enrollment and high prices. Today, the average cost per month is $200. How did that affect the medical cannabis program here? The first year of the program it can be looked back upon as it's really nothing but a smashing success from LeafLine's perspective. Um, Minnesota was not the first state in this country to pass medical cannabis legislation. We were the 22nd. Uh, having said that, uh, we put forward a very thoughtful program, um, taking in some of the extremism that has occurred on the coast and learning from programs that had been started before our program and launched what we believe to be the first truly medicinal medical cannabis program in America. I don't think that the medicine available in Minnesota is ever going to be comparable to that available at the illicit market. You know, this is a, this is a plant, after all, that a person can grow in a garden. So the idea of paying thousands and thousands of dollars just to obtain that from a legal source here in Minnesota is kind of offensive to a lot of the people who can't afford to do so. Heather is the senior campaign counsel for MPP, Marijuana Policy Project, where the national organization's main focus is ending marijuana prohibition. Why do you think that's important to regulate marijuana like alcohol? Well, prohibition has not been effective. It simply doesn't work for marijuana any better than it worked for alcohol. Mm -hmm. It doesn't keep marijuana away from children. Uh, upwards of 80% of our high school seniors for at least a couple of decades now have, re have continuously said that marijuana is very easy or, or somewhat easy to get. Mm -hmm. That's 80%, right? Um, we can do a much better job of controlling access to the substances, monitoring their safety, if we regulate marijuana. We need to take the commercial production of this stuff away from the criminals in the illicit market and put that in the hands of licensed businesses who follow rules that are written by the government in order to prevent the public harms that can be associated with its use. That's why proponents of marijuana are pushing for a new law to legalize recreational weed. Havoc that alcohol wreaks on our society is absolutely insane and yet we're spending 
all this money and all this time prosecuting people for what's a harmless substance. It's as logical as taking someone who's having a $12 cocktail in the North Loop, taking it from them, giving them a criminal record, and then telling them that they're going to have to check a box on every single job in the future. Like myself, I had a broken bone here and I'm supposed to be on 15 milligram Oxycontin and I refuse to take them because it's more easier for me to smoke weed and it deals with my pain. It should be legalized here also. It'll stop a lot of the gang violence, a lot of the violence in the, in the street, and a lot of the drug dealers on the corners. Once you legalize a substance, you can regulate it. You can tax it. Um, and if you don't give those former drug dealers a criminal record, they can help be a part of a booming new business. Because right now, with the current uh, alcohol system, like it's it's harder for a minor to get alcohol because you know they can't walk into the store and get it. They can't get, necessarily get alcohol on the streets. But like, whereas marijuana, you know, if the government regulated it and taxed it and controlled it, it would be less accessible to whoever they don't want it to be accessible to. Right now, the current system in Minnesota is a joke. It's only available. I'm on it due to threats, but it's a joke. It's too expensive. It's only available in oil form, and it's a waste of time. And they're not serious. It's not helping anybody. People are going to do this anyway. John Applebaum, who represents House District 44B, introduced the first bill of its kind which would allow the cultivation and sales of marijuana for personal use in the state. What would be the similarities and differences between your bill and others that have passed across the nation? The bill that I wrote is very similar to the one that passed and is in place in the state of Colorado, meaning it would be legal for anyone aged 21 and up to consume marijuana by up to an ounce and it really would be regulated like alcohol as the Colorado law provides. So no one can use it in a car, employers can regulate uh, whether or not you can use it at work, and safeguards would be in place so that it is as safe as can possibly be to ensure that no one gets it that shouldn't be using it. In 1969, 12% of the country favored the prohibition of marijuana. Today, 60% of Americans favor its legalization. The war on drugs has been a remarkable failure, and people our age and millennials, anyone under 40 years old, essentially, this is a non-controversial issue. Attitudes are changing on a variety of subjects. We live in a much different world now than before, and marijuana is something that I think most people know is not harmful, can provide a lot of benefits. It has proven to be beneficial in the medicinal capacity and people are rightfully asking questions like why not? Why shouldn't we consider something that's proven to be a much less dangerous product than alcohol and legalize it, regulate it so it's safe? After Colorado legalized recreational marijuana in 2014, becoming the first state to pass the controversial law, a billion dollar a year industry emerged. Other states saw similar results after passing the law. What we're seeing in Colorado and Washington right now um, is the, the illicit market declining. Um, Colorado believes they've captured about 70% at this point. Um, Washington's governor has recently stated that he, he feels that marijuana now, the commerce in marijuana has now been replaced by licensed businesses instead of um, criminal gangs. In addition, the tax on the legal marijuana in both of these states has produced a significant amount of revenue. In Colorado, it was more than $200 million last year. In Washington, it was more than $255 million. It's going to lead to so many benefits for not just Minnesotans, but everyone coming to Minnesota. It's going to lead to increase in tourism. It's going to lead to a lot more tax revenue. Conservative Congressman Jason Lewis says he doesn't want his kids to be smoking pot but thinks it should be up to the states to decide if recreational marijuana should be legal. I was happy to co-sponsor with Republicans and Democrats to frankly get the federal government's footprint out of this issue. This is an issue that if Minnesota wants medicinal marijuana, and I am in favor of that, they ought to have it. And if California wants to have recreational or Colorado, let these laboratories of democracy work it out and we'll see how the experiment pans out. When we return, the efforts to remove criminal penalties for marijuana use. Marijuana, a mixture of dried shredded flowers and leaves, comes from the hemp plant. After a national campaign in 1937 against what was called evil weed, marijuana became illegal after Congress passed the Marijuana Tax Act. 
Then in the 60s, following the movement of counterculture and liberal idealism, marijuana use became more widespread. The harsh laws associated with the drug reduced, and by 1972, 11 states decriminalized marijuana. However, the nationwide movement of conservative parents against marijuana birthed the war on drugs in the 80s. The Anti-Drug Abuse Act was signed setting mandatory sentences for drug-related crimes, still classified as a Scheduled One drug, alongside heroin. Harsh laws for marijuana possession remain in place today. You have at least a quarter million people who are consumers now. So all of those people would, and most of these people are good, responsible people, you know. As the executive director of Cannabis Education Minnesota, Marcus, a user himself, has been transparent and outspoken on the movement. Why should the state of Minnesota legalize recreational weed? Adults should have the freedom to consume this plant. It's a plant, it's not a crime. <laughs> we should have that civil liberty, you know. Prohibition is not stopping, I mean, they might stop some of the supply, but, but there's such a huge demand. I mean, 30 million Americans smoke it. So there's always going to be that underground industry that supplies it. <laughs> so, I mean, prohibition has failed. They could use all those law enforcement resources dealing with real crime, because the majority of all the property crimes and the violent crimes go unsolved. So if law enforcement was, if they didn't have to enforce these, these uh, nonviolent victimless crimes, they could spend more time dealing with real public safety threats. We could save that money. I mean, we spent about $150 million a year just arresting and prosecuting people. And then, like you say, the vast majority are just consumers. One of the biggest arguments proponents have is the efforts to remove criminal penalties for marijuana use. In 2015, law enforcement reported more than 6,800 arrests in Minnesota for marijuana, more than a third of total drug arrests. I was once smoking down by the Mississippi River. <laughs> and this University of Minnesota police officer came down there and she, she smelled and saw the smoke. And I mean, we just smoked a joint and it was gone by then. But she wanted to find more. So she held me down there for like two hours. Kept pulling me in and out of the back of this squad car. Kept on frisking me. I felt like I was being sexually assaulted because she kept grabbing my crotch and just giving me a hard ass time, excuse my English, because she smelled and saw some smoke. FBI statistics reveal black users of marijuana are arrested at a rate of nine times higher than white users. How has this affected the minority communities in particular? It's really a tool of oppression by the state and it targets people of color mostly. Like in Minneapolis, the ACLU had a report. They said that 11 and a half black people get arrested for every one white person in, in Minneapolis. So. It's a racially discriminatory enforcement of the policy. You might have someone who doesn't commit any other crime but, you know, smoking cannabis. And if they're afraid of encountering the law, that's going to deter them from cooperating with the law when they might be able to help if they're a witness to a crime or if they're a victim of a crime even. So, it, you know, it doesn't help law enforcement. <laughs> it makes their job more difficult. The penalty for the first offense of possessing a small amount of marijuana in Minnesota is a $200 fine and mandatory drug education. It's not just the arrest and the jail that causes problems for people that come in contact with the criminal justice system because of this. There are a host of collateral sanctions that, that spiral from that. You know, you can, you're no longer qualified for student loans, for example. You'll have difficulty obtaining employment. Uh, public housing may be eliminated. Um, all of a sudden, you know, there's major life changes that happen as a result of this stuff. How do you think removing penalties for those who choose to use or possess marijuana, how do you think that will create a system that regulates the production and distribution of marijuana similarly to alcohol? 
Well, it doesn't by itself. Um, you know, those are two separate issues. Many states in the country right now, including Minnesota, have decriminalized possession of marijuana to a certain extent. Here in Minnesota today, you can possess up to 42 and a half grams of marijuana, and it's a, a petty misdemeanor, um, not, a, not a misdemeanor or a, or a crime that would end you up in prison anymore. Mm -hmm. However, there's no legal source for anyone to purchase that cannabis, right? Yeah. Even if it were legal for an adult to possess up to an ounce of marijuana in Minnesota, there's no way to obtain it lawfully. So the source then is, of course, the illicit market, drug dealers, gangs, um, violent criminals, you know, the, the toughest and hardiest of these criminals who are willing to take the risk and make these sales. And they don't target, you know, they, they target children. They don't card. They don't check IDs. They're not regulated by the government. They're not licensed. They're drug dealers. Mm -hmm. Which is the very reason many argue legalizing marijuana for recreational use will abolish the black market and rid drug dealers. Do you think it will also reduce organized crime? Um, Absolutely. Drug That's a great point because, because it is illegal. A lot of criminal organizations, like real criminals. I mean, there's a lot of, of, of weed men who are just, they're not criminals. But there are a lot of like gangsters and real bad people who take advantage of this being an underground industry, because it is an industry. I mean, it's probably a billion dollar industry right. un right. underground right. in Minnesota alone. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it'd be nice to take, take that power away from uh, these criminal organizations. Up next on Our Issues Twin Cities, what it will take to legalize recreational marijuana in Minnesota. Since the inception of Minnesota's medical marijuana program in 2014, the registry has increased by 300%. Today, there are over 4,000 patients. LeafLine Labs alone sees over 1,500 patients per month. What makes LeafLine Labs unique to the country? Physician-founded and truly patient-focused. Uh, this is not tr a transaction to us. This is compassionate caring of people. And truly what we are seeing is healthcare is being reformed right here in the heartland. We are truly inspiring change by simply caring more, um, caring wisely, uh, caring better when possible. Lee says medical cannabis has changed the way he lives his life today. Not being able to do those things, he said that's the worst, that was the worst feeling for me. So when I got that back, I felt like I, you know, I was, it was the greatest thing in the world. Um, and once my family saw the change over a short period of time, they were very, very supportive. You know, I take every moment that I can if, if I run into somebody that I haven't seen in a while and they know kind of where I was at before and they start asking me like, hey, how are you doing? You look good, what's going on? I take every opportunity I can to tell them how this has changed my life. Following the addition of intractable pain to Minnesota's cannabis program, PTSD was recently approved to join the list of conditions for patients seeking to receive medical marijuana. Patients certified with PTSD will be eligible for the program in August. What other conditions do you think might be added to the program next? Going forward, uh, there are other conditions that were not approved during this cycle, uh, though I suspect with the mounting research that's being done internationally uh, for conditions like autism, mm. for conditions like anxiety and depression, mm -hmm. um, they will get serious consideration in the coming days, weeks, months, and year. Today, 28 states have legalized medical cannabis. Minnesota's program remains one of the strictest, where patients are prohibited from cultivating their own cannabis and using marijuana in a smokable form. A major distinction between Minnesota's program and that of other states is that the other states allow a patient to put, purchase the whole flowers. Patients can then use those flowers to make the form of the medication that works best for them. Um, you know, whether that's a juice that's non-intoxicating or some kind of an oil, or maybe it's smoking, you know, um, titrating the dose of medical cannabis by smoking or inhalation by, of a vapor of some kind is a very effective treatment me method for several patients. And although it was an uphill battle to legalize medical cannabis in Minnesota, passing personal use of smoking marijuana is not so likely anytime soon. Recently, Attorney General Jeff Sessions warns of an America with marijuana sold at every corner grocery store, 
President Donald Trump gave his nod of approval. With the pushback of Governor Mark Dayton on the issue, do you see recreational marijuana becoming legal in our state? It's not going to pass with a governor who opposes it in the traditional way that a bill becomes a law. But there is a way, and there have been two bills that were introduced this session. The only way I see it happening anytime soon in Minnesota is if our legislators propose a constitutional amendment, which puts the question on the ballot for the voters to decide. So there was a bill, a traditional bill that was introduced that would have to work its way through the legislature and land on the governor's desk for a signature. That's not gonna happen anytime soon, especially with the legislature we have. <laughs> what, what, what about in the next five years? Do you think it will? It's possible. Yeah. It's very okay. possible. Representative Applebaum doesn't expect recreational marijuana to become a law for another six to eight years, but proposed the bill to start a conversation, a conversation that has never been talked about at the Capitol. It's time to start pushing some new ideas out there. People are tired of politics as usual. As a young person, I identify with this issue. My friends, my peers, my colleagues don't understand why no one's ever done it before. So I envision truly a made in Minnesota billion dollar economy where anyone can grow it. Minnesota farmers and others can grow it. Minnesota businesses would distribute it and Minnesota businesses can sell it to consumers who can use it safe, safely within their homes. In the 1960s, Americans took to the streets to protest the harsh laws of marijuana use. The still images, once real, have come to life once again today as people rally to abolish the prohibition of leisure weed. Many locals are hopeful Minnesota will become the ninth state to legalize recreational marijuana. But the probability of the bill to have a public hearing this year is unlikely. Thank you for joining me this week on Our Issues Twin Cities. I'm Renika Mann. See you next time.